Okay, we ready? Movie recording. All right. Good afternoon, students of God All Heckler Commercial Photography Section 2, May, March 2nd, 2016. Yay. Okay, so what we're gonna what we've been working on all semester is is developing some camera tool language skills. So we are talking about aperture, shutter speed. ISO, metering, and, and so you, in this last project with your food project, I asked you to talk about your exposures, what aperture you use, what ISO you use, what your shutter speed was, and the, your light source. Was it natural light? Did you use a fill light? So we could start developing more of a photo language. And, um, by now, most of you know what shallow depth of field refers to, especially after photographing the food, uh, vegetable close-ups, uh, where in fact you want what? A shallow depth of field, uh, so the whole image is not in focus. So if you use a 5.6, obviously your, your, whatever you're focused on is going to be sharp, and then you're gonna have fall off in the background. Uh, and now if you close down, like we saw with Lena's picture, when we close down the aperture to f16 or f22, uh, everything in the picture is going to be in focus. So I just want to show, show you some just drawings, very kind of elementary drawings, but that helps you define... I'm sorry? You don't have to, I mean, unless you want to. Okay, so first, I'm going to just draw some pictures that kind of define that concept of aperture. And, and some of you have seen this with me in my former classes, but I just think it's a, a good way for you to understand it uh, visually. So I'm going to just draw some circles with circles within the circles, okay? Okay, what does that look like? This is a part of the camera that relates to something on the human face. What is this? Eyes. The eye. So what does the eye relate to in the camera control? The eye and the sun. The light light light. When, you, when the sun is really bright, your pupil shrinks. Oh, so, which, so which one would it be? The... So this is when the sun is really bright. So what happens to your pupil? It shrinks. It shrinks? It shrinks. Okay, that's a good word. It shrinks. What happens if you go into a really dark room? It's light. It dilates. Your pupil dilates. So what happens? It gets really black, right? And then if you go through different lighting scenarios during the day, your pupil is going to do different things, depending on the amount of light that's in the room. Okay, and after you've done photography forever and ever and ever, you can walk into a room and almost instantly tell what kind of light there is. You're checking for the light. Okay, we've got a backlight coming in from there, we've got a light coming in from here, we've got a light. What color is the light that's being emitted from there? Is it ultraviolet light that's balanced for daylight? In the past, they were all emitted the green light. And so we had to balance it with a magenta filter. Daylight, as we had talked about, what color is daylight? Yellow. Blue. Blue. It's all measured by Kelvin temperature. Um, when we're dealing with hot lights, and many of you took your still lives with just the model light that was in your soft box, that would be Kelvin temperature 3200, which is an incandescent light. And so it has an amber color. And therefore, the more you know about light, the qualities and properties of light, when you walk into a room or go outside, you can already understand uh, the, the sense of the color, what it's like in the early morning, and as the light goes up, and when it starts going down, the sense of what colors it at the end of the day. And that helps you determine 
what time of day you want to take your photograph. Whether, and that's what we used to do a lot in the field, was go out and look at a location, but we also were looking at that location to determine when the best time of the day would be to take the photograph. Okay, so what does this relate to on the camera? The aperture, which you have been working on all the way up to now, this semester. The aperture, and which is known as what? F-stop. So in the past, uh, with film cameras, we had more limited numbers of f-stops. We had like a 2.8, we had a 4.6, I don't remember all the numbers, 5.6, f8, f11, f16, f22, f32. They were basically duplicating each other. Now you have fractions of numbers for f-stops. So there's many, many more numbers, many, many more openings, uh, f-stops, for the digital cameras. But what, when you have just a tiny little dot in the eye, the pupil, what f-stop do you think that looks like? 5.6. That's the last f-stop. That's at 22. Because it's narrow. Okay? So the more narrow it is, the sharper your picture. The script had changed back then. So soft. This is Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Girls with privilege. Okay, so. Um, <laughs> okay, so what about this one? 1.8. F stop. F 1.8. What what lens? What lens are you going to find that F stop in? Are you going to find it in an 18 to no, 55? No. Okay, why? I don't know why, but I can <laughs> Okay, uh, where are you going to find the 1.8? In a fixed lens, which would be like which lens? When in film days, it was always in the 50 millimeter lens. Okay? 50 millimeter lens, which uh, is still a great lens to buy. Okay? Because it's expensive. And you have the widest aperture. How much does it cost? Is it this one? Is it cheap? How much does it cost? Well, they have to go to a camera store to determine that. Every thing. No, it's it's from two hundred, three hundred or four hundred. Let me see. I got mine for my video. I got mine for fifteen hundred. Okay. This is a 1.8 Nikkor 50 millimeter lens. It's a beautiful lens. Where is it? 1.8. <laughs> okay. Um, it doesn't look like it's been used. And it goes from 1.8 to f22. Okay. So um, it's a pretty, pretty lens. And what's missing from this? The UV film. The UV filter. Yeah, I have it. Totally, absolutely, paramountly important to get UV filters. As soon as I go back to the US next week, I'm going to buy all my UV filters are broken, falling off. Huh? Can you get me one for this? Huh? Get Don't they have UV filters here? I don't know. Yeah, they do. They do. They have them. Anyway, so um, this, this, is, this is basically the millimeter. Okay, now we have like this plane of vision, right? And so when we're talking about 50 millimeter, and I'm not drawing, my math teacher would go, ah, fail. 50 millimeter. It is the lens opening of the human eye. We all see the world almost, it's actually more like 45. We're looking at the world through 45 millimeter, okay? Uh, 
But 50 is a beautiful um, paper. You use uh, 50 almost exclusively, right? No, 55. 55, well, close. And, and she's, she's not using any fancy lenses, but she's constantly shooting that shallow depth of field. Is that the 50 millimeter, it gives you that ability to do that. Yeah. I'm sorry, it's it closed. It's not recording. <laughs> I think it's recording. Yeah, it's recording. Yeah, it's recording. Hey. All right, so. Now I feel like one of those YouTubers making those stupid jokes, right? Oh, sorry. Okay, so what's after the 1.8? 2.6. Okay, 2.6. And then what? 5.2. Okay. I'm just going to write in some numbers because every lens is going to be a little different. Okay, so you're going from a very wide open aperture to one that's closed all the way down. And each lens in the digital world uh, has actually what they call that sweet spot. Uh, and f11 is usually the place where the, you're going to get the sharpest imagery. Even if it says f16 or 22, your lens, you have to see what where it sharpens uh, the best. So do you see that what we're doing, for each stop, you're basically uh, adding more light. So when you go into a very, very dark room, what does your uh, eye do? It dilates to the degree or to the proportion of the amount of light that's in the room. And that's f stop. Okay? Now, do we have that? Do we have that image in mind? Okay, now, that works. You cannot take an exposure based on aperture alone. You have to shoot with what's the other part of the exposure mechanism that you have to be concerned with. Hmm? ISO and shutter speed. Okay, so I'm going to take the <laughs> Okay. Take a picture. Oh, it's missing one of the eyes, but you get you kind of get the picture, right? Okay. Uh oh. This pen is not really. Okay. Now I'm going to I'm going to talk more about shutter speed, and then I'm going to show you. Girls, then we're going to. You have to go to give a good impression that everyone's being fun. Uh, uh, shutter speed. Shutter speed is measured in what? These pens are. Is your middle line, which is 1 60th of a second. Generally, 1 60th of a second, although with digital cameras you can usually go farther down the scale, is, is where you can hold your hand, hold your camera, and still get a, a sharp image without using a tripod. But many of us can go all the way down to even half a second sometimes. 
But if an image, if a person is walking in front of you, unless you use fancy exposure methods, uh, your person is going to be blurred unless you use the proper shutter control uh, speeds. Okay, so when you go up the scale to 125th of a second, 250th of a second, 500th of a second, and 1,000th of a second, we're talking about movement. When you go down the scale, 30th of a second, 15, 8, quarter, half a second, one second, fall. Okay, this is when we're slowing the motion down. Uh, so when you are shooting, for instance, a sports photographer, what do you think they're going to be wanting to shoot? One thousandth. Huh? One thousandth of a second, most likely. Uh, no lower than five hundredth of a second. Okay, if they're going to be shooting soccer, depends on the movement involved also. But generally, uh, two fiftieth of a second is a safe bet if you're going to be photographing people just even walking like this slowly. Okay? If you don't, there's so many people, why, like even when we're at the castle, why is my picture soft? What's your shutter speed? 30th of a second. What do you think? You're not stopping the motion. You're not stopping the action. So a lot of sports photographers put their cameras on shutter priority, set their shutters at 500 or 1,000 or more at of a second, and then just have the shutter on that speed, and the aperture will adjust automatically to whatever the speed is, okay? And the same goes when you were shooting aperture priority. Let's say you wanted your picture, you put your camera on aperture priority, you set your aperture at 5.6, and the shutter speed would adjust automatically to the aperture. Okay, so it works both ways. When you look at your camera dial, I need to get another pen. When you look at your camera dial, right, you have aperture priority, uh, shutter priority, manual, and then you have your EV settings, Right? Um, so if you have your aperture at 5.6 and just set at 5.6, the shutter is going to automatically adjust to that 5.6. If you set your shutter at, uh, if, if you put your dial tone on the Canon, it's different. I'm doing the Nikon. If you put it on S for shutter priority, then, like, let's say you put it at 500th of a second, then your aperture is going to adjust automatically. To your speed. Okay, so where would that be really useful is in sports and this or in motion, and then aperture priority is excellent for what? Portraits, uh, still life, landscape, you know, everything where you're you're just you're more concerned about the, the depth of field. Okay? So six. Do you notice anything, any pattern between these numbers? They're double of each other. <laughs> okay, 60th of a second, 125th of a second. 125th, 250th of a second. So that's when you start, when we were shooting film photography, we had to, that, that's why I could just write it out, because you just have it in your brain. When you don't, when you're shooting digital, you can look, get this instant feedback. But when we're shooting film, we had to know these numbers. Okay. Uh, okay. So now you're going to see how it works together. How many of you know how to work the aperture and the shutter speed together mathematically? No. No. Okay. <laughs> Shutter speed priority. Unless you're shooting a manual. Okay. I, if, um, if I 
increase the shooting speed, I should increase the Yes. Whatever you do to one, the opposite happens with the other. Okay, I, I, I like to say that ISO, shutter speed, and aperture control exposure, uh, and they're married. However, they can never get divorced. <laughs> because they're, uh, they can't work with the, the other. They're completely dependent on each other. So they're like Siamese uh, couple, right? They can never be apart. Whatever you do to one, you have to do the opposite to the other. So first of all, when the first thing you should do when you take a picture is determine the ISO. In film, it was ASA. Okay, so now it's ISO. Um, and then you have numbers like 50, 100, 200, 400, 800, 1600, 3200, 6400. Did you see a pattern with those numbers? You see a pattern with those numbers? Mm -hmm. There you go, the beauty of photography, it's math. You know, it's a mixture of math, science, and art. But the more you know how this works, the more control you have over your picture. Now, in film days, everything was double, double, double. Now we have 500, 150, so we have divisions of those numbers. But let's just say, look at it in a more simple way and look at the double number. So if you, let's say you choose ISO 200, okay? Because the light is, it's your typical Saudi day with plenty of sunshine. Okay, you've got plenty of sunshine, so you're gonna set it, let's say on 200, between 100 and 200. Uh, but let's say you have it two hundred. Hmm? Okay, so let's let's just hypothetically, we're setting your ISO at two hundred. It's a it's a normal day outside. It's not middle of the day. It's maybe three o'clock in the afternoon. A couple hours before the sun's going down. Okay, so uh, I'm just photographing some street scenes on the Corniche, out near the Red Sea. Okay, so there's, uh, let's say it's a little bit later than that, four, 4 o'clock, so the sun's not so strong. 4 o'clock, 4 p.m., 200 ISO, and I'm going to photograph some people hanging out on the rocks. You know, it might be fishing, or people, I mean, I've been there so many times, fathers with their children, mothers with their babies, and you, you've decided to you want to set your uh, shutter speed at about 250th of a second. Okay? Now, with an ISO, and let's say you're shooting on manual. Okay, so we're doing total manual here. So then you see that your aperture is F8. Okay, let's say you're perfect. You look in your meter, you know how to read your meter, right? You have the meter and you see these, and then you have the zero, and your needle, your needle lines up to the zero. Okay, so it's not here and it's not here. It's right at the zero. That's not to say it's a perfect exposure, which means a good reason to bracket your exposures to go higher or lower. It's always advisable to have three shots if you can get it of the same thing. Okay, so let's say your perfect picture is ISO 250 of the second at F8. But you look at the picture and there's slight blur. Uh, not enough speed. So what are you gonna do? Oh, 
Okay, let's say I increase my shutter speed to 500 of a second. What do I have to do to my aperture? You have to increase. To what? So you're actually increasing, in a way, the amount of light, but a smaller number. Which would be what? That, my darlings, is photography. <laughs> I mean, that's it in a nutshell. Okay, all right, let's, let's go through this scenario. You've determined an ISO. You've, you've found a good exposure, 250th of a second at f8. But then when you look at your picture, ah, some blur. I need to, sh I need to have a faster shutter speed, so I'm going to go to 500th of a second. I'm shooting on manual, so I, then I have to adjust my aperture for it to equal this exposure. I want it to be exactly like this exposure, but I want a faster shutter speed. So this, you know where you had in, in algebra, x equals blah blah, x over y plus whatever? It's kind of like that. This is exactly the same formula as this. So when you understand the balance of photography and can figure out the formula, like I'll be looking at my camera, like, okay, I'm shooting at a sixtieth of a second at f uh, five six, sixtieth of a second at five six, uh, a bit too slow. I want to go to one hundred twenty fifth of a second. Uh, what's going to be here? Okay, so whatever you do to one, you have to do the ratio, the, the same ratio to the other. Um, let's say, okay, not a mention, who mentioned changing the ISO? Okay, you can change the ISO. Let's say, okay, let's say I've got this one, 250 of a second at F8. I want a faster shutter speed, so 500 of a second at 5.6 equals this. Okay, let's say um, another formula. I can go to ISO 400. So I've basically doubled the amount of what? Sensitivity to the light. Um, then what? So basically, if I increase the ISO, I want to have a faster shutter speed, I can still keep the same f stop. So if we weren't shooting something that's not moving very fast, that's what you have to kind of think in your head all the time. You know, you have to know the numbers. Okay. So this would, this scenario was at the point you show people are moving. So let's say if it was a still life and the image was soft. So I there's a what now? There's a what? Still life. Still life. So Where? I shouldn't play with the shutter speed. I want a sharper image, so I should play with the uh, f stop. Okay. Does anybody want to take a picture of this? Yeah. I'm just showing you some very simple formulas here, and then I'm going uh, to go back to the coronation and still life. This is very simple stuff, and then later I'm going to show you in the book some other uh, mathematical formulas that are based more on the mathematical uh, and physical properties of photography. But this is just, this is almost like... Uh, Obviously, you've had, you have a lot of photography experience. You certainly know how to set up a still life. You know how to set up a portrait. You know how to 
do all this fancy stuff in Photoshop, but a lot of you don't understand the basic mechanism of photography. Because I found that even being out in the castle with you, why is my picture soft? Why is my picture this? Why is my and that's stuff you should know by now. Um, because it's just it's just such basic stuff. And it, and it's really Actually, it's not that basic. It's, that, it's actually very hard to, to kind of get. Uh, and I think it was easier for those of us who were doing the film because we had to get it. Otherwise, you just wouldn't get pictures. You know, you're processing all this film and you're wasting a huge amount of time if you didn't know this stuff. Um, so a lot of photographers now, even professional photographers, just shoot on automatic. You know, it's, it's easier. Okay, so um, it's still recording. Yay. Do you think this is helping by recording this? Yes. You have all the numbers. You see the pattern. You know, science and light. Light is part of science. It's 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 kind of perfect. You know, like why would it be imperfect? Everything about it is so perfectly in alignment. So once and it doesn't change. The only thing that changes is the value of the light, the color of the light, the time of day, which is going to directly affect the exposure. So the light is strong, and then it's weak. The, uh, the light is yellow, and then it's blue, it's green, it's reflecting off this surface, you're combining light sources, incandescent, daylight, uh, artificial lights, and they each have their own reflective color, you know, and, and color property. You understand this when you're working in Photoshop. You understand when you're working with color balance. Oh, that's too blue. I'm going to add some yellow. I'm going to add some amber. That's too green. I'm going to add red. It's all light. We're, we're combining light. Photography is about photographing light. Know, and how much light is there. But it's all kind of perfectly formulated. Whoever made this stuff like knew what he was doing. <laughs> oh gosh, who could that be? All right, so you got this? About the ASMR. Yes. The last question. Uh, when do we increase and when do we decrease it? Okay, uh, that's a good question. When do we increase the ISO? So if you don't have enough light, why don't you just open your aperture or decrease your shutter speed? It won't be enough. Hmm? It won't be enough because you'll like need... the picture could get very long. Okay. And, and a lot of time, sorry? And you might want to have like a shoulder next to field or longer next to field, so the ISO will help with that. Okay, so if you increase your ISO, what are you uh, also more vulnerable to? Resolution. So everything in photography is a balance, and also, uh, in a way, a sacrifice. And you know, when you talk about a married couple, there's, they're always having to compromise, right? <laughs> uh, and so photography, in a sense, is like a compromise. What, what do you want? What is your achievable goal? What is it that you really want? Do you want the resolution? Do you want the sharpness? Do you want the depth of field? So first you have to kind of know what your intention is. The sharpness. Okay, so uh, ISO, of course, um, I think sometimes that graininess is perfect. Sometimes we want the graininess in a photograph, right? It looks good. Like a lot of the old photojournalists work from 60s and 70s, there's a lot of grain. We wanted the grain. You know, sometimes we put film in the, in the, uh, developer solution with the intention of making it green, like by making the water hotter. That'll make the film more grainy. So people would do that on purpose. And so at the same token, you can increase your ISO to like, you know, uh, obviously with the, um, uh, the new cameras and the gigantic sensors, uh, you can 
use a much higher ISO because the plane of uh, the optic plane is so much clearer. But with the small cameras, I was so disappointed last weekend. I was out with some friends and, and we took some pictures with the uh, iPad. And they looked great on the iPad, but then when I pulled it into Photoshop, you know, I took this like 180 panorama picture. It's like, and I blew it up to this somewhat visible portion to be able to put on Facebook. And it just didn't look good, so I just dumped it. Because I don't I don't want that kind of stuff. <laughs> What, what question didn't I answer, Miss Miss Princess? Oh, the ISO. When I increase and decrease, you told me you know, when I want the sharp ones. So I'm like, okay, when and if I want the sharp ones. If you want sharper picture, then you're more concerned with shutter speed. Okay. And uh, you also have to be very clear in your lens and your focusing. So it's not just the sharpness and the clarity, it's not just your exposures, but it's also hold, how you're holding your camera, how you're, um, uh, the, how you're metering it. I mean, it, it involves every aspect of the camera and the tools that you're using. But this is your exposure controls between how much light's coming into the lens and the time it takes to take the picture. That's the, the aperture, ISO, shutter speed. So for instance, I'm going to just show you a little picture. Can I take this off? Just in a, in a nutshell. Okay, so here we have like, let's say this is your camera box. And here's your lens. Right, pre-bought camera lens. This is the light coming through your lens. So that's aperture. Then the light goes through the lens, and here's your plane of where the image is going to hit. Okay, and then you have your SD card that's like here. In the past, what happened is you had film going through the camera. So every time you shot the picture, the film would advance. But now what happens is there's a mirror, which is your shutter. And when you go, first when you press your finger on the shutter, it focuses. When you press halfway down, you feel it focusing, right? And then when you click the shutter, this mirror opens, your image hits the, the focal plane sensor, and the mirror closes. That's shutter speed. So, light goes through the lens, goes through to the back, to this uh, sensor. Mirror, basically first the mirror has to open, Boom, picture in, zzz, mirror close, next picture. Uh, so the amount of time the mirror opens is the shutter speed? Correct. So do you ever listen to your shutter speed? You go click, you can hear if it's a slow shutter speed. And I'm, yes. like, and I'm thinking that's too slow, yeah. picture's going to be soft. But when you hear click, And the sound of a beautiful shutter speed is just awesome. Okay, so now like when you put your camera setting on C or S, that's taking one single frame at a time. And so each time you take a photograph, it's refocusing. You can also put your camera setting on C which is continuous. And that's what a sports photographer is going to use. They're going to put their camera setting on C, and they're just sometimes just going to hold that shutter down, like a motor drive. And at that point, the camera is not refocusing every time. 
So sometimes that might be a choice you might want to do, is put it on continuous, so when you press down the shutter, it's just going to focus on where you have focus. You know what I'm saying? Okay, so you understand this is kind of like, uh, if I posted something like this on YouTube, you'd probably laugh at me. But on the other hand, I could probably get a million followers. Because I'm just showing like such basics that most people don't know. You know, I'd say 90% of the population doesn't know this, this basic stuff. Okay, so let's take this one step farther. You have your SD card, right? So we're going to just take a look at ISO. So what are we filling up the picture, the SD card with is pictures, right? So what are these measurements? So let's say you have a 64 what? Gigabyte. Gigabyte card. So what is each picture is taking up what? Megabytes. Megabytes. And that depends also on the uh, camera you're using. Right? Also the type of the web. Like raw or JPEG. Okay. Raw. JPEG. Okay, so let's say, um, let's pull out one picture from here. So this is your one picture. And let's say you have ISO 200. made up of what? Pixels. I'm just going to fill it up with pixels. What a post-impressionist painter in Paris painted with the dot hmm? Pointillism. Surat. S-E-U-R. You look at his painting, they look like megapixels. So that is 200. When you increase your ISO, what you're essentially doing is taking away pixels. So if I went to 800, you're losing some resolution. You're losing some information. Okay. Now, uh, I'm glad you brought up the raw. The raw image is where you get Let's say you have your blacks and your whites and your grays. You're getting all the hues, tones, saturations. When you shoot a compressed picture, which is a JPEG, you're losing some of those. So you're not going to have the full tonal range. Okay? So, um, one of the things that we used to get quizzed on in photo school, we'd get like a test sheet with 20 questions of those mathematical formulas I just showed you. So let's say your shutter speed is at a um, thousandth of a second, at f2.8, and then you want to change it to f60, at what would your new aperture be? Yeah. But see, those are things you should practice. You should practice with your manual settings and, and just stand in one place, you know, like at the corniche or somewhere, and play with your camera settings. Look at your ISO. First thing you do is you determine your ISO. Next thing you determine what is my objective here? Is it to get pictures of people moving, stop, stopping the action? Or is my objective to get a beautiful picture of someone's face uh, where the eyes are sharp and the knee planes of the face are sharp, but then everything falls off in the back. The buildings become soft, the tree is soft, 
So then you want to have an aperture at about uh, 5.6, 2.8, 2.8. Okay, talking about lenses, let's move along to that real quick. As long as we're on this roll, and then I'll give you a break. We're doing a Rapido camera digital course. Okay, so we're talking about lenses. The first kind of lens, it's, it's like our angle of view, 18 millimeter, let's say. They're measured in millimeter. Then we go to, let's say, 24. 28, 35, 
Now, the ideal kind of lenses to have, like you have, and these camera companies have somehow established that you have the 18 to 55, and then the 55 to 200, with uh, like a 3.5 to 5.6 uh, setting for your open, for your aperture. Okay? Now, once you get into the higher price lenses, let's say you have, um, I have a 80 to 200, 2.8. It's one of my lenses and bring it back with me. So 80 to 200 is like beautiful lens, 2.8, super wide opening. I bought it like 15 years ago and I've been using it forever, it still works. And um, today it's probably about $2,500, just, just for the lens. I probably paid $1,500 for it, but it's an older lens, it's pretty beat up. Um, I'd like to get a 300, like a 75 to 300, be about $3,500. So, uh, it, you know, you're paying for glass, especially if you're, you can get a 200, 55 to 200 for about less than $600, but you're not going to have the aperture. You're not going to have the 2.87. Does I have a 70 to 300, but it goes down to like 300? Yeah, it's like a quarter of the price of uh, one with a 2. Eight uh, lens. That's what you're really paying for. Is the magnification? Uh, how is a fixed lens any different? Uh, well, what do you mean? Is it any different? How is it different? Well, a fixed lens tends to be easier to focus. Um, but I don't even know how many fixed lenses they're making. As opposed to the film yeah. But why is it that like on a 50 fixed lens, you are more likely to get the 1.8 aperture? Why is it only on fixed lenses? I want you to look into that and answer that question after our break. Okay, so let's take a uh, 10 minutes break. I've been going full steam here for nearly an hour and a half. Yes.